Hey everybody, welcome to episode 86 of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. My name is Kieran, and I have been metal detecting now for nearly 30 years. So this week we talk about something I would love to have an opportunity to explore further at home, but would require me to travel to continental Europe to do it. And that's World War II relic hunting. So let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, before we start, I want to thank you for listening to the podcast and I hope you enjoyed the episode this week. If you want to support the show, there are many options available in the links in the episode notes below. And if you want to interact with me and the show, that information's in there too. But most importantly, if you like this content, please don't hesitate to tell your friends and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode. I hope you have all been awesome to those you love and tolerant of those you don't. So this week I want to talk about World War II relic hunting and we will get to that in a minute, but let's discuss the latest news from Nocta Macro first. So last week, as you know, well, the 19th of November, they announced the eagerly awaited Legend, their simultaneous multi-frequency machine, to huge excitement. I have to say it was great. However, there was some backlash online saying that Nocta Macro were unprofessional comparing themselves to their competitors and calling out how the legend is better in certain regards. There was also backlash saying that Nocta Macro didn't invent multifrequency and that they are stealing from a certain brand and producing a knockoff. Loads of negativity from a certain quarter of brand fanboys. Now, every brand has fanboys, and before I started this podcast, I was a Mine Lab total fanboy and wore the hat and all. But in educating myself about the hobby through the podcast, I've come to realize that the detector doesn't maketh the man, and if you're committed enough, you can find treasure with just a shovel and knowledge of where to dig. Now, all brands have a certain level of militant fanboys. I had myself in the past to tell a Nocta Macro fanboy to calm down as they angrily ranted at Nocta Macro themselves for not releasing a statement of when they were coming out with their SMF. This was just a week before Nocta announced the Legend event on the 19th, which this same fanboy then proceeded to give out about the price and the fact that there was no manual ready yet. So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And no matter the brand, you will always have these individuals and always have the emotion that comes with it. However, back to the launch, as all things tend to be online, this feedback got out of control and descended into getting personal, insulting Delec from Nocta and how the launch was delivered, etc. So at this stage, in response to the backlash, Delec from Nocta released a statement via video across all social media this week. This was an emotional and passionate rebuttal of the, as Delic put it, bashing insults and slander. To be honest, it was great. Delic answered a few questions, but then laid into the naysayers. And she must be a listener of the podcast as she called out that multifrequency has been around for years with whites back in the 80s. She finished with the statement, competition helps all of you. And if you enjoy what you're swinging, keep swinging it. I will include the audio from the statement at the end of this week's pod, but be warned, I may need to remove it due to copyright. I'm not so sure of the legal stance of doing something like this, but better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Wink. It was great. If it's not here, make sure to search YouTube for it. Anyways, back to our regular broadcast this week. So this week, I want to talk about World War II relic hunting, something that I have dabbled in in the past, but not in the way you might think. So when I was a boy, I grew up in a place called the Curragh Camp. It's Ireland's largest army base, but one of the oldest. And what was special about the Curragh Camp was that during World War II, it was the home of Ireland's internment camps of Ireland's prisoners of war. So you may or may not have known Ireland was neutral in inverted commas during World War II, which meant that any pilots or sailors from either the Allies or the Axis powers that happened to find themselves in Ireland were sent to the internment camp in the Curragh camp. Now, just to be factual and why I put neutral in inverted commas, Allied soldiers were sent home via the UK, while any Axis personnel were sent to the internment camp in the Curragh. 
Now, don't get me wrong. This was not a prisoner of war camp like you see in the movies. These prisoners were allowed to go into the local town for a drink and buy groceries. And so many liked it so much that a fair few of them stayed in Ireland after the war, marrying our women, with some of them fairly high up in the military staying, which resulted in a later controversy. But that's for a later episode. So in the 1980s, I moved to the Curra camp. And at that stage, the internment camp was empty for well over 35 years and falling apart, but an absolute dream playground for a young boy. And it was there, rooting around the derelict black huts, as they were to become known as, that I found buttons, gas masks, helmets, and a tetanus shot from standing on rusty nails. But being young, none of these survived me and my friends playing war on old Sherman tanks, I'm afraid. Now that I know what potential these had from a historic and even monetary point of view, it makes me cringe at the thought of the lost relics from World War II. Okay, so World War II relic hunting is a type of metal detecting, primarily, as you can imagine, a European pastime. Not so much an Irish one, but definitely a continental Europe, Eastern Europe, and most definitely a Russian pastime. Now, This is not to say there isn't a US interest in this, because God knows we had American soldiers fighting on every front in the war. It's just that for you guys, you'll have to get on a plane over the pond to partake, which makes it prohibitive. Now, Europe is a big place, Kieran. How do you know where to hunt? Well, I wouldn't expect to be rocking up to Normandy Beach with your detector in tow. As you can imagine, there are loads of battle sites that are very strictly controlled, especially when it comes to metal detecting, simply due to the enormous loss of life at these sites. So it is best that you consult the National Archives of whatever country you're hunting in. This will give you the World War II battle sites. Some are even broken down on a week-on-week perspective, so you can see and calculate the movement of the front and thus pinpoint sites that may be great starting points. Now, it's just over 80 years since the start of the war, so the 50-year moratorium on information control should be well passed in whatever country you are in. But if there is not much information, and I would be surprised if there wasn't for such a big thing, check out your local libraries, local historic groups, websites, you know the drill. To be honest, there's such a large body of documentation about World War II that it would be impossible to not find what you are looking for. Remember, this is still very recent history and still in living memory. So you've identified a potential location, you've checked the law, you've got permission and any permits you may need. But now, how do you hunt these spots? So World War II relic hunting is probably the only part of our hobby that pulls in all aspects and types of metal detecting. For example, waterways, bridges and rivers seem to be hot spots near or between battle sites as many bridges were contested for transport purposes and were essentially bottlenecks where weapons were dumped to keep them from falling into enemy hands or simply fell off trucks in the bumpy ride over the bridge or river. Because of this, magnet fishing is very popular at these sites, but coupled with underwater detecting in all metal mode can be the difference between a good day and a great day. Reading the terrain is essential. A lot of people think that trench warfare was solely in use in World War I. This is due to the mobile nature of the front in World War II. However, in places where the front didn't move so fast, trenches were used to great success. Essentially, the Maginot Line is one great big trench. Trenches from World War I are still visible today, and the ones created in World War II are no different. But be it in fields viewed from Google Earth, or simply walking through a forest of Eastern Europe, these are easy to spot snaking across the terrain, indicating a potential spot to hunt. Foxholes exist in similar condition today as they would have 80 years ago, only more shallow. You just need to look out for them. I have to take a minute to say that every trench, every foxhole and pillbox is the site where someone has most definitely died. So make sure you're allowed to hunt there but also make sure you're not desecrating the grave of a fallen soldier with the potential to be called a grave robber. Just look what happened to Chris Rogers. We all know Chris, super enthusiastic detectorist, did a lot for the hobby over the years, gained some success online with his Addicted to Bleeps channel, got involved in a Main Street media company who wanted to produce a show called 
World War II history detectives, which was on Netflix there for a while, but resulted in some very serious backlash from the public, calling the guys grave robbers and everything that goes with that. But turns out the media company were pushing the guys to find stuff because, you know it, it's not a show unless there's fines. And when they find stuff, they edited the show to make them all look like spanners. We have seen this happening so many times in the media. Anyways, it took Chris years to get over that one emotionally, but that's what you could be dealing with here. There is a very fine line between grave robbing and rally hunting. So for me, I would just stick to the rivers. As you can imagine, this type of rally hunting is huge in Europe, with people making significant investment in magnetometers, sonars, ground penetration, radar, the lot. As you can imagine, if you're investing in that level of equipment, that you're looking for large targets that can be buried up to six feet deep, requiring a lot of work to get them out hand digging these craters. Even if you don't have all the expensive equipment, you need to set yourself up for a long hunt. Some people spend days camping overnight while they detect during the day for days on days. If you talk to these guys, they all say that keeping dry and comfort is the most important thing, much like the marching soldiers of World War II, I suppose. They all nearly hip mount their detectors, allowing them to hunt for a few hours longer due to the swing weight reduction. So what are you looking for? Well, weapons are pretty top of the list, I'd imagine, with guns, knives, bullets being popular finds. There is a potential for unexploded ordnance, which you have to be careful with when disposing. Imagine that every shovel you take out of the ground could potentially be the last due to hitting a mine or a shell. This is why it is important to be surgical digging a hole World War II relic hunting. You can't just grab a pick and go. Other popular targets are uniform related. Gas masks, helmets, buttons, insignia. You can only imagine, but the big boys use their expensive equipment to look for vehicles like tanks, jeeps, motorbikes and even planes. All worth a fortune if recovered. This is not much different than normal metal detecting, running your detector in all metal mode, except you need to set yourself up for long term hunts, both physically and organizationally with batteries and a way to charge them. You need to be prepared for a lot of physical work digging targets that are deep while digging very surgically, taking the Russian roulette factor out of the dig. It is expensive to get to the hunting grounds and equip yourself for success while ensuring that you are respectful of what you are actually digging and aware of any laws that may apply to what or where you're hunting. That is why I would call World War II relic hunting one of the most extreme and dangerous activities of our hobby. That's it for this week. I hope you liked this episode of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. Check out our website, www.themetaltechnishow.com for this episode's show notes. Check out our Patreon page if you want to help the podcast stay alive or just want to buy me a coffee. If you want to buy me a coffee, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com forward slash metaldetecting. Also, if you'd like to leave me a voicemail, please do so on speakpipe.com forward slash the show. The link will be in the show notes. If you feel like taking your appreciation to the next level, Feel free to leave me a positive review on any podcast directory of your choice. If you like this content and would like more, please don't hesitate to tell your friends and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and we will chat to you all again next week. Get out there, eyes down, good luck and happy hunting. Hey guys, I'm just about to add a deluxe statement here at the end of the podcast. It's the noise level is is shocking. It's a real bad quality recording. However, I'm still going to add it in there. But bear in mind that there's a lot of background noise in the in the recording. So um, I'll add it in there. I've tried to process the noise out as best I can. But uh, yeah, bear with it. It's a very entertaining and uh, interesting uh, soundbite. Listen, thanks again. Hi everybody, uh, this is Dilek with Nortamarco. Today I would like to give you some uh, information on the legend as I see a lot of uh, questions, confusion, um, and I want to clarify a few points. Um, now, the first thing I want to talk about is I see people um, debating 
uh, and making comments on the multi frequency. And uh, some people are saying, oh, uh, is this a multi frequency? Uh, is it not? Uh, is it simultaneous multi frequency? And um, I thought when I uh, did the presentation, when we released this detector, I thought we were very clear that this was a true simultaneous multi frequency machine. Okay, and it is. Okay, I see some comments saying, "Oh, um, it's maybe it's not multi uh, multi frequency, but it's dual frequency." Guys, no. Okay, please do not believe anything you read on social media unless it's coming from us. Look the map the engineering and the manufacturing company of the ledger. I guess we're the ones who know this product better than anybody else. And what I don't understand is how how can people make these comments, claims, you know, uh, on a product that they have never ever seen or touched in their lives, okay? So this product is a true simultaneous multi-frequency product, period, okay? That's number one. Number two. Now, I see some confusion about the um, multi modes used uh, in the product. Uh, so let me explain. There's a multi mode used in beach. Uh, there's a different uh, multi mode used in beach. Uh, I mean, uh, park and field. And there's a different multi mode used in the beach mode. Okay, park and field and beach mode. They have different multi modes. And in the beach mode, we also have two different multi modes. Okay. And um, one for uh, uh, one is called wet dry, uh, with wet to be used in salt water uh, and wet salt being said specific. So I hope this explained. Okay. Uh, now um, another thing uh, is the question is which frequencies uh, are running uh in the multi modes now this is one question guys that i don't e even know the answer of because the engineers engineers will not even share that information with me because that's confidential information okay and i believe our competitors were asked this question many times and to my knowledge they didn't answer it either okay so uh this and i understand because it's confidential okay uh, so now I want to talk about uh, something else and uh, the, the bashing, the slander, and the insults going around regarding the, this machine. Now, when I say insults, uh, it, it got to the level of insulting myself, okay? Uh, my selling skills, my presentation skills, whatever, which I'm okay with because I don't care okay you those people okay and i'm assuming the majority of them are the fans of my competitors okay uh they're not my friends they're not my family so i don't really care but what i'm not gonna let anybody do is to bash this product okay or slander this product now let me clarify a few things that they're criticizing us on okay Number one, uh, some people said that it was very un unprofessional that during our presentation, I brought uh, the competitor in the subject. So it's okay when my competitors bring the, the competitors in their subject or in their commercials or in their videos, that's okay, but when Nocta Macro does it, it's very unprofessional. If it's unprofessional, sorry guys, it's unprofessional across the board for everybody. I'm sure you all um, saw those videos, you know, except no uh, uh, imitations or the yellow going, yellow red, red fights going around. Come on, okay? So I'm sorry, but let's just be fair, okay? So, and let's look at what I said during the presentation. Uh, what did I say? I said, here is a fully waterproof device, truly waterproof device, unlike the, um, you know, competitor's device, 
uh, which uh, has leakage issues. Hmm. Now, what's wrong with this? Is this a fact or not? I know it's a fact because everybody knows that there is such an issue. And it's okay, it may happen. I've had problems in the past, okay? As a manufacturer, that's fine. But it was just a fact that I was st uh, stating because Nokta the macro is, I mean, uh, the, the housing of the legend is really praised for its waterproofness. Now, the second thing I said, when the competitor released their machine, they said they were gonna obsolete all the single frequencies, right? That was their big claim, which kind of pissed me off back then because as a manufacturer, you cannot decide on that. Only the end users have the right to, uh, have the right to decide on that, not a manufacturer, including us. Now, what I said was wrong or right? Yes, because they did say this. And then what happened, Simplex Plus, a single frequency machine took a leader position in many countries across across the world. So this was just a fact I was stating, okay? Now, number three, what did I say? I showed the pricing in the United States, 949 versus uh, 635, $314 difference. What's wrong with that? Nothing, right? Because it's a fact, okay? So uh, another thing. Now, I see a lot of people saying that the legend is a copy, okay, or a knockoff of the competitor's model. Let me tell you, for those people who do not know, Simultaneous multi-frequency, multi-frequency technology is not, not underlined, owned by my competitor. It's been around for many years. It's been used in many different industries and it's been used in this industry by whites, okay? Long time ago, whatever. Everybody has their own way of doing it. And we did it uh, our way. And we are here to provide you guys, all the customers with a device at a better price with uh, uh, more features with more performance and guess what that's wrong so um people are saying that it's uh, that uh, it's um professional that i mention these things i'm sorry guys but which stupid i'm sorry marketing person would go out there okay would go out there and say my product is worse but buy it anyways okay um so i don't understand what the uh fans of my competitors are upset about guys why are you upset what is it an ego thing listen if you're enjoying what you're swinging that's fine that don't treat the manufacturers like we're soccer teams or football teams competition helps all of you why don't you understand this i mean i simply don't get it okay what is it uh, uh, there is no need to get to these levels if you enjoy what you're swinging keep on swinging it we are here to give a choice okay to the customers don't what are you scared of don't be intimidated okay I said this before, let the manufacturers compete. You and users do not need to compete uh, between yourselves, okay? And please stop this copycat knockoff thing. Enough already. I mean, seriously, it's getting to a ridiculous, funny level. Because you know what? What is it that you want? So this, the technology is owned by my competitors? I don't think so. It's been around for so many years. So you're telling me, actually, the first car manufacturer on the face of Earth, Ford, should be the only company for all these years, for 100 years, making cars only, and nobody else should be making cars because they're all copycats? Give me a break, okay? Please. Or you want a monopoly. Is that what you want, guys? Seriously. You want a monopoly? You only want one company making devices in this industry? so that they can charge you whatever they want and you don't have any option? If that's what you want, please be my guest. But as a manufacturer in this industry, as a serious player now, I'm not gonna let that happen. 
I promise our customers to give them the best products at the best prices. And that's what I'm doing. And you can say whatever you want. Copy, knock off. I'm sorry, guys. We have a big crowd now. A big customer base in the whole world that trusts us. And those days are gone. We're not to knock the macro that our competitors used to laugh at. I'm sorry, okay? We love our customers and we give them what they want. You know the, what, the only reason why we're doing a simultaneous multi-frequency uh, device? Because our customers asked for it, okay? I'm sorry. I apologize if I sound a bit upset, but for these people, poor people, I mean, I don't know what else to say. For these characters, uh, I call them the keypad worry warriors, to write all this and to insult me, an executive of this company, uh, my presentation skills, my whatever, which I said, I don't really care, you know, but I'm not gonna let anybody, anybody slander or, or um, bash this company or this brand. You know why? 250 people work at this company, guys, and we're in Turkey. We're so proud of what we're doing, okay? We, this, 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 this uh, country is going through tough times like many other countries, okay? Economically, whatever. 250 people working at this company. And there's a lot of effort, a lot of hard work behind this product. And I'm not gonna let anybody, neither my competitors nor their fans, to bash my product or to bash this company, okay? I love you guys. If you have any questions, uh, please ask about the device. Again, do not believe anybody. Do not believe anybody. Uh, when I say anybody, do not believe any posts that you see on Facebook groups, on other social media, ask us. We always try to be as, as, um, as uh, transparent as we can, okay? You know that. When we have a problem, we say it openly, honestly. Uh, when I released the Simplex, we had a coil issue. What did we do? Did we try to hide it like some of my competitors have done with their uh, problems or kept silent about it? No, we said, guys, we have a problem. We're stopping production, okay? That's what we did. We try to be as transparent as uh, possible, okay? We're not afraid of anything, okay? And please, the fans of my competitors, please respect fairness, okay? We're not forcing you to do anything. You may love any brand you want. You can swing any, any product you want, okay? Don't, don't get intimidated. This is just, just an option that we're given to customers around the world, okay? This is how it goes. Competition, competition, no monopoly, okay? It's good for you. I love you, we love you. If you have any questions, um, please ask me. Uh, there's a lot of messages going on. Uh, can we uh, the swimline people? Uh, oh, the, the, the pin pointer. I just saw a, yes, we're working on a pin pointer. Uh, it's not going to be ready very soon, but we are working on, by the way, guys, my battery is about to die. If this, uh, uh live stream ends, um, it's because of my phone, because I'm doing it on my phone. Uh, any other questions? Uh, by the way, uh, there's a lot of other criticism. Okay. About the, well, oh, why isn't the manual ready? Guys, I mean, come on. Like when uh, people announce things, everything is ready. No, I mean, yes, it will be there. Just be patient, please. I mean, do you know that I'm the one who has to actually translate it and then, you know, I'm not a robot, okay? So we have a whole team here working on different things and uh, now I need to work on that manual, but uh, it's gonna be done. Uh, up there guys okay don't worry about it uh don't try to find things to criticize don't look for things to criticize and bash on there is no need please okay 
Uh, what else? Uh, that's it. Uh, I, if I don't talk to you again, uh, we wish you, uh, my phone keeps on ringing, so, uh, my, keeps, uh, my phone keeps on ring, ringing, I'm sorry. But if I don't talk to you again uh, uh, until then, maybe I will, but if I don't, I uh, wish everybody a Merry Christmas and, um, and uh, legendary 2022. Please be patient. We're gonna hopefully start shipping the product in December, okay, not before. And I don't know the exact date in December. I'll try to share as much information as I can. I'll try to answer um, answer uh, questions. Uh, I'm on different groups, but uh, as I was trying to answer, you know, uh, questions on different groups, I saw all these, you know, um, comments, claims, inaccurate stuff. That's why I wanted to make this video. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I'm going to share this uh, on different groups. Hopefully this puts an end uh, to some of it. I'm sure it's still going to go on because some people will never change uh, and I'm not interested in their opinions. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, I'm sure this is going to put a stop to some of the ridiculous things going on about this detector. Okay. I love you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.